Hey, um, we've been doing a series called Elephant in the Room. Elephant in the Room is generally referring to things in a situation or a family or a community that you like to ignore because it's a bit awkward to talk about. And so it's the elephant in the room. Everyone knows about it, but you don't talk about it. So we've talked about issues to do with sexuality and the struggles that so many of us, well, pretty much all of us in this room, go through in exploring what it means to follow Jesus and working out what it means to be faithful with our sexuality. Um, we talked about the struggle of singleness and the challenges of singleness and the blessings of singleness. We've talked about the struggle and the challenges and the blessings of marriage. We've talked about, um, last week, we talked about some of the things that we all struggle in in the area of our mind, the things that we think about that are not healthy to us, the things that we lust after. And, um, and uh, I shared some stories from my life and as I chatted with some of you afterwards person after person says yeah this is stuff that it's not just a certain type of person but we all struggle with these areas and so this morning I want to talk about another elephant in the room and it really is just the fact that we all have sins and brokenness that no one knows about isn't that true if your life was to be put up on a big screen in fact, here's some people's lives that we've prepared earlier. No, I mean, it would be freaky. If it doesn't just talk about the things that you've done, but the thoughts that you've had, the internet searches that you've made, the motives that were in your heart even when you did a good thing, all up there, it would just be like, uh, all of a sudden I think we'd all need to go to the bathroom and not come back. It's just like, okay, what did I say? So the elephant in the room is that we all have sins and brokenness that no one knows about. And so, but the, the title of this message is really that I want to drill down on is the fact that you will never walk alone. Um, I'm a Liverpool fan in the English Premier League. And before every game, the crowd stands and sings, you'll never walk alone. And no, I'm not seeing. I don't feel it this morning. I just see if the spirit's flowing, and no, doesn't. Don't feel like singing this morning. But the crowd sings this great anthem, "You'll Never Walk Alone," and they hold the scarfs up high. It's a great rally cry for the football club. And there's actually football clubs all around the world that do sing, "You'll Never Walk Alone." In fact, I heard about this. I think it was Borussia Dortmund in the German Bundesliga and they sang this just recently in solidarity with a, a fan of their club, a young boy that had died of, tragically of cancer. And these two teams, they stood and they sung You'll Never Walk Alone as an act of solidarity saying to the family, you might just be a fan, you might just be a supporter, but we are family and we're feeling with you. And so the whole club, the players in the club, they all said, as a club, it's not just the, the, the players that are earning millions of dollars, it's the fans that pay their tickets and support the team that we stand together and we say you'll never walk alone even through the dark times. And isn't there something awesome about that? Isn't there something great about football clubs? You know, you hear about people saying football teams and sporting teams are great places in dark times and times of tragedy because people band together. And that's certainly my experience of the church at its best. That often we're at our best when things are at their worst out there. Do you know what I mean? When do you get the, wor the best commentary on the humanity of people? It's generally when there's been a bushfire or there's been a tragedy and people band together and they said, you will not walk alone. And even though you're my neighbor and even though you're someone that might be anonymous to me, I'm gonna reach out and touch you and help you and support you because you are a brother and sister in the human race and I'm gonna stand with you so you're not alone. And there's something about that that makes me just like, ah, oh, that's what life is all about. Not walking alone. And that's what the church should be about. Not walking alone. And when you think about inspirational movies of people going into war and you think, how could you fight a fight where you know you're going to get defeated? Sometimes it's because of the people that you stand next to. And you say, I'm going to fight because I'm with my family in this battle. Or people that, when in movies or in life, when people are going through the dark times and you think, man, 
it's just amazing to see how they walk together. So we all know in theory that it's good to not walk alone. But why in practice do many of us choose to walk alone? I think it's because sometimes it's just too hard to admit the elephant in the room that we're not okay. It's too tough to admit that we're struggling with an addiction. It's too tough to admit that we are a perpetrator or we are a victim or recipient of domestic violence. It's too hard to admit that we're, we've gone bankrupt or we're about to go bankrupt. It's too hard to admit that we're struggling with desperate loneliness. And so sometimes we walk alone, not because we want to walk alone, but because it's so hard to be vulnerable and to open ourselves up to, the, to, to other people. So sometimes we can suffer in silence. And I suppose this message is about the elephant in the room is that the person sitting next to you has got issues. Now, don't tell them that. It'll be highly offensive. Some of you just did that anyway. Highly rebellious church. Highly rebellious. But it's newsflash. The person next to you has issues. And some of the issues, it's not just that we sin, because sin at its core is not just about what we do. It's about the orientation of our heart towards saying that we are our own Lord and Saviour and we don't need to put God first, that we know better than God. And that permeates through our decisions and our choices and our motives. And so I want to start by reading a a fantastic scripture from Galatians. So sorry, I was just going to finish what I was going to say before. So don't think that you're alone. And don't think that there's a certain category of person in this room that's not grappling with an area of their brokenness and an area of their weakness. Now, we as a Christian community, we don't delight in sin. We don't delight in brokenness. But we acknowledge the shared humanity and the fact that God has brought us together to be a family and to walk together so we will never walk alone. Now, Galatians 6 verses 1 to 10. Let's read it together. Brothers and sisters... If someone is caught in a sin, you can live by the Spirit. You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourself, or you may be tempted also. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they're not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who carries, who receives instruction in the word should share all the good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. And if we do not give up, Therefore, if we have opportunity, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially for those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord, and it was then, and it is for us today. And what I want to start by just drilling down is that first verse of Galatians chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin... You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Just go to the next one, I think. Next slide. Now, this is really challenging because we're talking, we've, we've acknowledged our shared humanity. We've, we've acknowledged our shared brokenness and the sinfulness of the person sitting next to us because they're heaps more sinful than us. So we've acknowledged that. Good. But this is talking about in the era of sin... We are, as a community of faith, because this is directed to brothers and sisters. This is not directed to the person outside of the church. This is not directed to people from other religions or secular people outside of the church. This is directed to the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's talking about with sin in our community, we are to restore people within the body of Christ when they are caught in sin. It's actually saying, engage with the sin in the community. Engage in the sin in ourselves and also with one another. 
I think the first observation about it, this is that Christians will sin. You can take it to the bank. This should not be a surprise. And it should not be a surprise that sometimes churches have hypocrites in them. And you joining the church won't make much of a difference because we are all hypocrites to some. There's a disconnect between what we say and what we do and our ability to live out life that we're called to live and we want to live. So Christians will sometimes sin. Now the Jewish zealots in Galatia at the time, they were being so harsh in their response to the sin of others. In fact, they were becoming puffed up and they were very clear in describing the problems with other people. They were very good at pointing out where other people were failing to live out the Mosaic Covenant in accordance with the way that they thought it should be lived out. And they were being so harsh in their response to the sin of others and it was crushing people. It was crushing them and it was causing a division in the church. And there are some of us in this room that we just enjoy a little bit too much telling people off. It's just like, yeah, I've been waiting for this. <laughs> Goody. I've been waiting to give this person a piece of my mind. Let me tell you, not just what you've done wrong here, but let me tell you about all the things that I've been remembering that you've done wrong for the last six months. I'm just a humble servant in the hand of God and I'm just this humble prophet and I'm going to point the finger and tell you what you did wrong and I'm enjoying every minute of it. I'm a shocker. Like when I discipline my daughter, I'm kind of like just... I'm kind of like the stereotypical, weak, disciplining father. You know, like I'm like, I'm sorry, honey. I really don't want to discipline you. This hurts me more than it hurts you. And it's true. I hate disciplining my daughter. Anyway, she's got me wrapped around her finger. Doesn't surprise some people. Amen. But some people actually delight in discipline. You know what I mean? Those types of people. It's like, oh, goody. Justice. Revenge. Discipline. (laughs) So the zealots in the church, they were being too harsh and they were crushing people. But some Christians are to the other extreme and they don't address sin and brokenness at all in other people's lives. It can wreck individuals' lives, it can wreck the church, and it can wreck our witness in the world. In fact, the church in Corinth, there was all sorts of jealousy, bitterness, um, There was like all sorts of terrible um, adultery and um, incest taking place within the church and the church was not addressing it. They were pointing out the sins of the world but they weren't addressing the hypocrisy within the church. And Paul's kind of saying to them, no, you are actually called to be the people of God. Stop focusing on judging people out there and actually start working what it means to be followers of Christ within the Christian community. And you are actually accountable to help one another in that. And so I think it's a danger to be too harsh to one another, but it's also a danger to ignore something. And as we all know, you know, sometimes if you have a problem or you get an email you don't like or you get a text message you don't like, you can want to ignore it, but it doesn't go away. I think this is about true about our own lives and also within community. The goal in talking about sin in community is not to crush people but it's for restoration that's what it says that we should restore a person gently and I've um, had people people in this room have actually come to myself or come to other leaders in the church and confessed struggle or sin or brokenness or addiction and we've been able to cover that person not shame them not expose them but to actually walk through with that person to the point where they've been able to be restored in ministry and they have not been embarrassed or shamed in fact it's really between them and God and the people that they're accountable to because God's God is passionate about restoration his goal for the world is new creation restoring his good creation But restoration should be in the spirit of gentleness. We should restore people gently. And I love the fruit of the spirit of gentleness. One um, commentator said this, that gentleness is not weakness. It is great strength under control. You want to show me a strong man? It's not someone that's violent or aggressive towards a woman. A strong man is a gentle man. 
a man that is strong but is able to control his strength and temper it and shape it with love and kindness. When gentle Christians see someone caught in sin, they don't react with violent emotions or arrogance, but with love and tenderness and kindness and wanting to see people restored. I've had a gift in my life of some quite assertive people gently confronting sin in my life. And I consider it a gift. In fact, I shudder to think of where I would be today if people that loved me and cared about me hadn't spoken a word into my life in in, in areas where I've been sinning or falling short or where I'd been self-deceived. These people include my mum, my brother, my kid brother who's seven years younger than me. How many people know that even your younger siblings can speak truth from time to time once a generation? My wife, Nikki, my boss, Bill, but this is a gift. And let me tell you that there's a massive difference between someone that loves you and cares for you and knows you, challenging sin in your life, to someone that kind of doesn't have much credibility or relationship. In fact, I've had some people challenge me in areas of my life, and they might have been right, but I have not received it well. But with some of those people, if it's come from someone that knows you and loves you, some of those times when people have challenged me has fundamentally altered me from heading down a road that would have been very bad for my life or helped me to open up to a blind spot in my thinking or my self-awareness and it's like God I'm so thankful that and, and, and the funny thing is so much so often when people challenge us in community particularly like let me just say in a marriage it's hard to sometimes hear home truths and sometimes when you get a home truth spoken to you you react in a very, um, it's, it's almost like a, I think sometimes our reaction can be stronger when we know that there's some truth to it. Do you know what I mean? So if someone insults me and, and, and accuses me of something that's deranged or completely removed from reality, I'll just laugh it off. But if someone challenges me and I know that there's a bit of truth in it because it taps into my own insecurity or it taps into something I'm already feeling guilty about, I'm going to respond like, how dare you say that? Who do you think you are? And it's often only years down the track you think, God, thank you that there was that person that loved me enough to speak the truth in love to me, to speak a, a word of challenge and encouragement with gentleness. So that's a gift. And I hope that you have gifts like that in your life I hope that you don't just have confirmation bias and you don't just share things on social media with people that agree with you and you don't just hang around people and that if your friend challenges you you're like okay this friendship's over and you don't wonder why you change friendship groups every six weeks number two what's this got to do with me carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ isn't that great We are to walk with people so as to help them with the burden that they can't carry. I think sometimes as Christians we need to speak in more um, down-to-earth language, less bureau, okay? So I think it's okay to say sometimes what I'm doing in my life, the burden that I'm carried, the struggle that I'm going through, the addiction that I'm going through, the relational struggle, the financial struggle I'm going through, I feel like I can't carry it on my own. It's too heavy. Do you ever feel like that? And I think it's like, well, you know, theologically, God's, you know, not going to give me something I can't take. And theologically, God is always the answer and Jesus is always the answer and the Bible is always the answer. But what if for a season, your way of expressing your faith and trust in God is to actually walk with another human being that can help you carry a burden that you feel like you can't carry on your own? God has actually created us for community and to carry each other's burdens. And so when you come to church, you and this is not just about you having your personal relationship with Jesus met in this kind of one-way relationship. This is us about gathering together as the people of God to carry one another's burdens, to go out and be the church, and as we are being the church, to carry one another's burdens out in our day-in, day-out lives, whether it be through connect groups, whether it be through social groups. It's okay to say, I can't do this alone and I'm not willing to suffer in silence anymore. 
It's interesting in this um, little passage in, chapter, in verse 2, there's a striking contrast that Paul's making between the law of Christ and the law of Moses. And, you know, Paul and none of the apostles and Jesus himself would never say anything bad about the law of Moses. In fact, the law of Moses was good. The law of Moses was to show us the character of God. It was to show us our need for repentance. It was to show us the way to live. But when men throughout history have distorted the law of Moses, we, and, and you see this in the Christian leaders in the, early, in, in the, the days of Jesus, they distorted the law of Moses to oppress people, to keep people down, and to make them feel guilty, suppressed, like they're failures, and they have to become something that they're not. And Jesus, time in and time out, he came to not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, and he actually embodied the true nature of the law. And he actually lived out the Mosaic law, but he also said, he, he kind of recast the law in, through a different lens to people had heard, than which people had heard in the past. And so Paul is saying, if we carry one another's burdens, if we gently restore people, if we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. The distortion of the law of Moses was interpreted, had been interpreted in the wrong way. And Paul here is elevating the law of Christ. The law of Christ does not crush people. The law of Christ liberates people. The law of Christ does not crush people and say you will always be a sinner and you will always be a failure. But the law of Christ says you are a sinner, but that's not who you are. That's not who I see you are. And I will liberate you from the yoke of of slavery to sin. I also think that this little verse says that we don't get to walk away. We actually get, when we come to church, You might look around and think, well, all these people in this church have got problems, but yeah, let me tell you about my problems. Let me tell you about how many problems I've got, but let me tell you this, that as the body of Christ, we don't get to walk away from other people's problems. That's not what you get to do in family. Do you know why? Because that's not what families do. Families carry one another's burdens. That's what families do. And it wasn't the way of Jesus. In fact, just this week in our Life Journal readings, we read about the story of the feeding of the 5,000, the only miracle that's in all four Gospels. And it started with Jesus having compassion on people and meeting their needs just after his cousin and one of his closest friends had been beheaded. And Jesus, in his grief, in his shock, in his lament, is wanting to have time out to himself. And how many people know when you want time out to yourself, that's generally the time that someone asks you to do something for them them and that's what happened to Jesus and he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them and he didn't just heal their sick but he met their needs for food and it's amazing that Jesus didn't just walk away when there was a need because he had a need at that time for solitude I like this next point how to make sure you don't become a jerk in this area because my observation is some of us People like myself that preach and speak in front of other people, it can sometimes come across that people that are the loudest, people that are the most picky on pointing out the sins in other people or preaching, sometimes can act like jerks. And if there's only thing worse than a jerk, it's an arrogant religious jerk. And I don't want to be like that. And I believe that the worst sin in the Bible, and in my experience, is the sin of pride. It's a sin of saying, because pride numbs us and insulates us from our awareness that we need to change in other areas of our lives. It's a really dangerous thing for us as Christians to speak into the lives of other Christians if we are not self-aware of our own brokenness and our own sinfulness. In fact, Jesus never sinned, but he was more humble than you and I. How dare we not be humble? How dare we speak to one another without humility of heart and without gentleness? Jesus chose the path of gentleness. Jesus chose the path of humility, even though he had every right to speak like a righteous and angry judge. So much of communication has to do with not what you say, but the way you say it. In fact, I believe that one of the ways that you can challenge and encourage other Christians to overcome sin and to follow Christ is to not be a jerk by getting your tone right and by learning to have empathy for another person. Even in the the political climate we live in at the moment, I find 
um, we've got a, the postal plebiscite survey coming up on the issue of same-sex marriage. And I find there's so many people just speaking past each other without much humility. People that are making the no case or people that are making the yes case. And I always feel like the best standard for communication is to first seek to understand the point that the other person's making and to have empathy with what they're saying before you seek to speak and say, okay, I hear what you're saying, I empathise with what you're saying and I'm not going to stereotype your argument. I'm going to have empathy but I'm also going to make the counter argument and I'm going to say it in a respectful and in a gentle way. So much of our problems in marriage, so much of our problems in friendship, so many of our problems in the public realm is not just what we say, it's the way we say it. Tone and empathy matter. They really do. And we don't need to violate our conviction and our conscience, but we have to make sure that we don't walk around thinking we are going to win the politics by any means possible. And in the process, we have people left, right and centre that have been hurt by our politics. That's not the way of Jesus. Have you ever been so right in an argument that you're wrong? This hypothetically could happen in some marriages, but it never happens in mine. Just got to say that. <laughs> when you're in an argument, and very early on in the argument, you know you've got the better, you, you know that you've got like a really, really strong case. And you've got evidence that she doesn't have. I mean, hypothetically. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, we're having an argument, but I know that I'm going to win because I have the evidence, I have this information, I have a piece of the puzzle that you don't even know about. And it's kind of like, I just know I'm going to win the fight. Uh, argument. Sorry. <laughs> and so... But then, stupid old hypothetical, let's just call him T. Lockins, um, <laughs> overplays his hand, is harsh in tone, is arrogant, is puffed up, is not loving, does not listen. And so I'm so right that I'm wrong. And then I'm just thinking, what an idiot I am. I was so interested in winning the argument, in being right, in winning the politics that in fact I have not treated my wife with dignity. I have not shown the way of Jesus. So, don't be a jerk. Have we all got that? Let's just read about what the scripture says. If anyone thinks that they're something, sorry, thinks that they are something when they're not, they deceive themselves. There's something about that. When you see someone that thinks they've got it all together, they've got all the knowledge and they've got all the swagger, but you see beyond that and you think, mate, you are so puffed up. God forbid that people think that about us. Let them disagree with us. Let them say, I don't want your gospel. Let them say, I disagree with you on this, this and this. But let them not think that we're proud and conceited and puffed up and not self-aware. Each one should test their own actions. And when they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Let's be... You know, have you ever heard the phrase, love the sinner but hate the sin? It sounds really good. It's like, Chad, sorry, I'm picking on you because I picked on Philip in the early service. Hey, Chad, I just want to tell you, brother, I just, I love you, man. You're a great guy and, you know, we hang out sometimes and you come into my office and we just talk and you've been a good friend and um, I, I, I love you, man, but I just really want to tell you, I just hate that sin in your life and I hate that and I hope you're encouraged by me telling you that I loved you first. Are, are you okay? But I love you, man, I love you, but I just, I just hate that thing about you and I hate that thing you do, but other than that, I love you, man. And, and, and there's a problem with the posture of that conversation is that I am pointing the finger at his sin and I think that a, a gospel posture is saying, I love you, Chad. And yeah, there's some things that Chad does that I struggle with, but I am so overwhelmed. I hate the sin in my own life. And before I start pointing the finger at Chad's sin, I want to be really humble about the fact that there's sins in my life that I need to overcome. 
And that's what I'm responsible for because I'm not responsible for being obsessed with pointing out the sin in my brother. Now, it doesn't mean that I can't encourage him. It doesn't mean I don't challenge him. But I see so many Christians pointing the finger at people outside the church. They don't follow Jesus. They don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. And we say, I love you, but I hate your sin. I tell you, I reckon we need to say, I love you, and I hate the sin in my own life because I follow Jesus. I have the Holy Spirit, and I still sin. And some of my sin is a little bit more subtle, but it's a sin of pride. It's a sin of self-reliance. And, and, and so it doesn't mean we have to change our theology or our doctrine, but we have to make sure that we don't become jerks. Jesus in Matthew 15, 19 talks about sin not just being about behavior, but it comes out of the heart. As Christians, we can be right in our doctrine, but we can be filthy in heart, attitude. We have to be soft and gentle and humble. Number four, using the Bible as food and not a sledgehammer. Now, if you do want to use the Bible as a weapon, I would recommend getting the new NIV Zondervan Study Bible. It is an incredible weapon. In fact, I think you could do more damage with this than a baseball bat. Um, <laughs> Verse 6, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. So what Paul's doing is he's speaking about carrying one another's burdens. He's, he's speaking about challenging and encouraging one another to overcome sin and to not um, allow and accommodate sin in our lives. He's encouraged us about not being proud and not being puffed up and not being unself aware of our own weakness and our own struggles. And then he talks about being instructed in the Bible. You see, I, I, I believe that Paul here is showing us very clearly that the way to overcome sin is not just to pray more and not just to think that sin is bad, but it's to be formed by the Scriptures. In fact, in the early church, there was a, a catechism process whereby um, groups of followers of Jesus would come and study the Scriptures together. They'd actually learn the Word of God. They would learn doctrine together. And that there were teachers, these instructors, who would, who would actually share around the scriptures. Because I believe that more powerful than proof texting and saying, do this and don't do that, is actually immersing yourselves in the scriptures with a small community of faith. Not a gathering like this, but a smaller gathering where you can study the scriptures together. And, and we don't just read what the Bible says, but we open up the Bible so that the Bible reads us. And as we share the scriptures together, we read about stuff and we realize because when we open the Bible together with a small group, we don't just read the Bible on our terms. We actually discover it together. And the Bible, it might expose some things in our lives that we're blind to. It might reveal that the sin that we think is really bad in the other person is actually not as bad as the sin that's in our life, but we haven't thought about it because we haven't really opened the Word of God. And so I believe that central to discipleship, central to overcoming sin, is not doing it just one-on-one -on -one or not just doing it as an island, but it's being part of accountable small groups that, where you regularly open the Bible together. And if you are not part of a small group, even if it's not a formalized connect group, if you are not part of a small group of followers of Jesus where you open the Bible together and you allow that Bible to shape your collective life and to speak into your collective life together, I think you are never going to be able to grow in the way that God would intend you to grow. In fact, even the way we do church services here with hundreds of people on a Sunday is, is so limited in allowing you to grow and become the man or woman that God's called you to be. Um, this is an important piece of the puzzle. I think corporate worship, fellowship, I think one-on-one -on -one devotional time between you and God where you just sit down and you read the Bible. But I tell you, if you just uh, if you, the only way you read the Bible is on your own, I think that's limited as well. I think that there is a place for studying the Scriptures in the context of brothers and sisters in Christ that can encourage and challenge you as well. When I was a, a teenager, I had a, young, I had a guy called Brad from my church. He came to my house every week and he had studied at a theological college. He'd bring his... Uh, New Testament Greek, and he'd sit down with me uh, when I was about 15 and 16, and every week we would study the book of Romans together, verse by verse. And some, of, some teenagers would find that boring. I, I loved it, because it was the first time in my life I had someone sit down with me and actually teach me how to understand the Scriptures and how to really dig into the Scriptures for myself. 
And so I would read this text, and he would read the text, and I would write all my questions down, and we would spend an hour each week, hour and a half each week, feeding on the Bible together. I think this is a really important part of equipping ourselves to, in the words of James, resist the devil and he'll flee from you, but also to equip us with what it means to be shaped by the word of God. We have a tendency to see other people's brokenness, but not our own. My observation is if you read the Bible regularly and you study it on your own, but you also study it with other Christians, you will have less blind spots to your own brokenness and your own sin, and the risk of hypocrisy will be diminished. Sowing and reaping. Let's read this. Do not be deceived. God can't be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Paul's now saying that, really, we have to be really clear about this. There is a connection between the choices that we make and what we sow in life and what comes back to us. You know what I, I think we do time and time again when we're not humble? We make mistakes or we make choices and we tell ourselves this lie. I'm going to do that thing in that relationship. I'm going to make that financial decision. I'm going to make that choice. But the consequences that happen to other people aren't going to happen to me. I want to watch that thing online. But the consequence, I'm stronger. I'm not weak. I'm not going to get addicted. I'm not weak. I'm not going to have an affair. I'm not weak. I'm not going to give up my faith. Rhubarb. I think the greatest challenge that we can have as Christians is to maintain our humility to say, God forbid that I could stuff up my life and I could hurt those people around me. I want to stay humble. I need your help, God, to follow you every day of my life. I often say, people that, that say things like, oh, I'll never, I would never do what that person does. I would never throw away my family. I would never wreck my marriage. Do you know what? I'm not going to say that. Because I know within my heart, I have great capacity to hurt people and to make foolish decisions. And so I, with God's help, say, God, help me to be a good father. Help me to be a good husband. Help me to not get ahead of myself. Help me to walk, not walk down roads in my thinking or, or, or make compromises so that I can keep you first and I can be the man of God that I'm called to be. I never want to be the Pharisee that says, thank God I'm not like those people. Whatever you feed will grow and whatever you starve will die. I think we have to ask that question of what are we investing in? If we're struggling with sin in our lives, if we're struggling with an area of brokenness from our past, we have to ask the question, how are we investing in that problem? Are we investing in the way of the spirit or are we investing in ways of the flesh that are going to make that problem grow and become more corrupted in our lives? And we'll finish with this, verse 9 and 10. Let us, become we let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Why do we do good? It's not because we have to or because it's an extension of ourselves. We do good because we are the people of God and we are family. Why do I... Actually, I get out of a lot of family stuff because my family lives in Sydney, but I'll talk about my family here, my, my wife's family. But if your family member is moving house... Are you allowed to say, no, nah, I'm too busy. I'm not going to help you move house. Because how many people know that's one of the worst jobs in the world, moving house? Can I hear an amen? And you always feel nervous because it's like, hey, Chad, I'm moving house, brother. What are you doing in three weekends time? And Chad's thinking, please be busy. Please be busy. Hey, oh, praise God. You, oh, oh, you know, just a little job. It'll only take about half an hour. And by half an hour, I mean half a day. And by half a day, I mean a whole weekend. Um, to come and help me move house because you feel guilty asking people to help you move house because it's, it's not fun and you're moving furniture and then you're moving carpet and there's bugs and there's mess and you've got to, oh, it's just disgusting. Who enjoys moving house? Not me. But when you're family, you don't have the option. You just got to turn up anyway because that's what family does. If your family member is going through a trial 
in a relationship or they're, they're really struggling with their mental health or they're going through a trial or they've just lost their job. What does family do? Family supports family. Not because you have to, but that's what family does. Well, that's what family should do. In my family, if I said to mum, hi mum, good to be back in Sydney, nice to be here. I'm just going to eat my dinner on my lap while I watch TV. Is that okay? She'll walk over to me, she'll grab my ear and she'll say, not in my household, young man. And I'll be up at that table eating with the family because in the Lockins family, we don't eat in front of the TV, we eat at the table. And, and in our family, we celebrate together. So the idea of not celebrating someone's birthday is foreign to us. So here it's talking about carrying each other's burdens, encouraging one another to overcome and not accommodate sin to be gentle and to be loving to one another. And it's saying that when we have opportunity, do good, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. He brings it back to family. He starts by addressing it to brothers and sisters and he brings it back to family. And he says, yeah, do good in the community, do good to your neighbours, do good to the whole world, but especially do good within the body of Christ because it's like the engine room of community health in the body of Christ that we need to show the love of God by the way we love one another. And the goal is that not that that's an insular thing, but the body of Christ will be so vibrant and so healthy and so perpetual that other people will be drawn into that body. And so it's not insular, it's actually inclusive of others. Because it's like if I, if I have a neighbour in need and I forsake my own family and I don't feed my own family and I don't pay for their school fees and I, don't, um, and I don't pay the mortgage, if I forsake my own family, my very ability to be generous to that family down the road is going to be diminished. You see, I see my family, I need to be a disciple of my family so that that's healthy and strong so that we as a family can disciple other families. And we as a church are called to love and to care for one another within this fellowship with the desire of more people coming in to the love and care of this fellowship. And that some of us in this room that are loving, that are receiving other people carrying our burdens, that we will be burden carriers in the future. Amen? That there are some people in this room that five years ago, people were carrying your burdens, but right now you are carrying their burdens. Or you are carrying bur the burdens of other people and you thought, wow, God, thank you for what you've done in my life that I can now, I'm strong enough that I can help other people. The family factor is really important. Can I invite the band up? Can we stand to our feet?